I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University of New York. Welcome to One to One. Every week, we address issues of timely and timeless concern with newsmakers and the journalists who report on them, artists, scientists, educators, social scientists, and government leaders. We meet each one to one. I'm delighted to welcome New York Times senior editor Dana Kennedy to the program. Her most recent assignment took her out of the comfort zone of objectivity to a book that couldn't be more personal. A Journal for Jordan, a story of love and honor, has just been published by Crown to absolutely glowing reviews. Jordan is Dana's young son, a son she shared much too briefly with her partner, First Sergeant Charles King. Stationed in Iraq, the career soldier wrote a journal so his son would get to know him if he didn't return. It was to be a guide on how to live life with honor. Sergeant King died when Jordan was just seven months old. Dana wrote about Charles' death and the journal in the Times. And because it was such a powerful reaction to the article, she decided to share the story of the love the three of them shared and the lessons she's learned about herself and life. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Your book was made possible by the amazing gift of this journal that your fiance mm -hmm. wrote. Mm -hmm. Describe it and what you learned from it that you couldn't have fathomed otherwise. Sure. This was really meant to be a guide for Jordan if his dad didn't come home from the war, which unfortunately is what happened. And he spent a year, almost a year in Iraq, writing this. He'd go out on his missions and come back in the evening, and I interviewed his roommate after he died, and he told me that his light was often on late into the night, and that's when he thinks he was writing in the journal. And in it, he wrote everything from the power of prayer, his favorite scriptures in the Bible, to the fact that it's okay for boys to cry, even giving Jordan advice on how to choose a wife. And so he really meant for this to be something that Jordan would grow up with and so that he'd feel like he could have a conversation with his dad, even if his father wasn't present physically. And you gave him the journal, right? I did. I actually bought it for him. I was in a store buying a gift for a friend, and I saw this journal meant for fathers. And I thought, well, maybe he'll write a few passages. I, I certainly didn't think he'd become consumed with it, which is what happened. And he actually told me when he was in Iraq that it was very therapeutic for him to end his days writing to our son. And he started it. In fact, I'd say wrote probably almost half of it while I was still pregnant with Jordan. We knew we were having a son. Did you read it in one sitting, or did you parcel it out? over time? I thought that I would read it over uh, a period of time, but it was so amazing when I received it that I, I read it in one sitting with Jordan sleep next to me, and I couldn't believe it because Charles was a very big, commanding military man, but he was also very shy and humble and quiet. He didn't talk very much. Uh, so to get this, this book where he's writing about the beauty of rainstorms and rainbows and about his first kiss in the eighth grade with a girl named Denise was incredible. Just incredible. He, he wrote about why he loved me, why he wanted a son, and also about uh, his love of being a soldier and serving our country. Now, the journal was meant for you and Jordan, mm -hmm. but you have turned it into a book. What yes. compelled you to do that? There were are, there are several things. I actually turned it into a memoir a journal for Jordan, incorporating his father's journal entries into it. I, I decided to do that instead of publishing the journal to give Jordan, actually, and readers a fuller account of our lives together and of the sacrifices that soldiers and their families make for this country every day, many of them without a book about them. And that was one of the primary reasons, but also I wanted to write this for Jordan, and that's why literally the book is written to my son. Every chapter starts, Dear Jordan. And so I feel like his father and I were working on this project together. He wrote his part, and I wrote mine and incorporated them together. And so those were the main reasons. But the other thing is, I wanted to remind people of the importance of speaking to your loved ones, whether it's through a journal or letters once a year on their birthday or a videotape or just an audio recording of your voice. This is the ultimate example of why it's important to express our love for the people that are important in our lives, and I wanted to share that. Now, you're a senior editor at the Times. Mm -hmm. um, 
Which, which beats are you, do you oversee? Well, uh, I was a national correspondent for quite a time. In fact, my first day as the bureau chief in Florida was the presidential recount in 2000, <laughs> which was quite an introduction. Um, and then I was assignment editor for national news for several years, overseeing our breaking national news coverage. Now I'm more of an administrative editor, uh, doing career development, training, diversity issues, working with our interns, and those kinds of assignments. Now the whole coverage of the, uh, you know, the Iraqi soldiers returning home. I mean, was that an area that you ever oversaw? Or did you ever have to recuse yourself from that because of your relationship with Charles? Believe it or not, it was actually a, this is a case where it was a benefit for me as a journalist. When I was assignment editor for National News, I helped to create a beat called The War at Home. And, and then the idea was to cover the impact of the war on military families here. And I uh, had a couple reporters assigned to doing that. Well, every time we reach a grim milestone in this country of a thousand U.S. soldiers dead or 2,000 or 3,000 or so forth, the media, uh, national and local, uses that as an opportunity to sort of take the pulse of the war and public reaction to it and so forth and to find out what's happened in the last year, look at trends, whether those soldiers have died from improvised explosive devices or, or other means. And we were coming up on 3,000 and preparing our 3,000 package, and lo and behold, Charles was one of them. And so I went to my bosses and said, I think I'd like to try to write about this, uh, the journal, and about Charles, because there are no other national reporters in the country living through this experience. And I told them I wasn't sure that I could do it emotionally, but I would try. Mm -hmm. And with the help of a good editor, I was able to do it. And so this is an example of where having personal uh, familiarity and knowledge in an area helped to develop uh, a beat at the times. Now, you've described yourself and Charles as a rather unlikely couple. <laughs> Most unlikely. Um, <laughs> what were the differences that attracted and mm -hmm. repelled you? Mm -hmm. Well, the primary one was that he was a soldier. I grew up on a military base, Fort Knox, on and near the base, lived on the base for a while, and then my parents moved uh, to a town right outside. My father was a drill sergeant at Fort Knox, and I never really wanted to continue Army living after I left for college. I wanted to go to the big city and become a writer. I thought I'd marry some big city slicker. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I met Charles in my parents' living room, and he was a soldier at Fort Knox, and I tell you, it's amazing how God knows what's good for you uh, more than you, more than you do yourself sometimes and he was just amazing he had such character and loyalty and strength that I couldn't help but fall for him but he was very quiet uh, very shy. I'm outgoing and talkative and so forth. And so we were quite different. He was a homebody. I like to go out and explore the world. And uh, we were different, but I tell you, uh, just real support for each other. He became my best friend, I his, and we ultimately became a family. And it's very interesting how, I mean, you were still moving around for the times mm -hmm. and he was still, you know, connected to various army bases. And That's yet right. you were able to maintain this long distance relationship for what, five or six Eight years? years? Eight years. Mm -hmm. Yes, we did that pretty easily actually because I was you know as you say moving around in different assignments for the New York Times he was training troops for many of those years readying them for combat and I knew that the work he was doing was really important and he valued the work that I was doing and so we were really supportive of each other's careers and it just wasn't an issue we were looking forward to the day that he would retire and move to New York and that was going to happen after he returned from Iraq because he had over 19 and a half years or about 19 and a half years of service in. As you know relationships between black men and women have mm -hmm. been portrayed as being very fractious, unstable, fueled by mistrust, resentment, <laughs> and all sorts of baggage from our racial past. But yours was a great love story. I mean, so in that sense, do you think your relationship with Charles was truly remarkable, un uh, unusual? No. No? I don't think it was unusual at all. I think that there are lots of couples like us, they just don't get publicity. Um, I'm proud of the relationship we had. And I'll tell you something that's been amazing to me. I've been on a six week book tour. My book's only been out that long. And I've traveled literally from coast to coast across this country to uh, uh, speak about the book in bookstores and on TV and in radio. And people who have shown up to, to hear me speak and to, to um, hear me read from the book have been from all walks of life, 
all creeds, all colors. It's been unbelievable. People sobbing in the audience or saying that they're praying for Jordan and me. And I'll tell you, when we were meeting with publishers about the book, someone said, oh my goodness, this is a, a classic love story that could have been set during the Civil War or something. And I said, not about a black family where the woman decided to have the baby before the wedding. And I really think it says so much about how, how far we've come, yeah. that people have embraced this book and our story. And it's an afterthought that Charles was black. It, mm -hmm. it, it rarely comes up. Mm -hmm. And, and that says a lot about progress. I'm proud of that. But I'm also proud that we are a black family. And this was a man who wanted his child, who planned for his child, planned for him while he was here, and also tried to find a way to be there for him in the event that his life was taken. Your parents had a very difficult relationship. They did. They, uh, um, they do, yes. Do you think relationships between black men and women have gotten better from your parents' generation to our own? I don't know. I'm, I'm not an expert mm -hmm. on that. Uh, I think relationships in general are hard, particularly long-term relationships. And there have been so many changes over the generation, the last generation or two, in terms of women having more opportunities in the workplace. And all of those things change the dynamics of relationships. And I think, you know, uh, men... Charles's age were were not taught as much to communicate or to express themselves with their children as much and and this generation of fathers does do that and so I think every generation relationships change and they are quite difficult but I'm hopeful that with more education opportunities for for everybody but certainly for African Americans uh, that our relationships continue to improve I think there's hope you decided to have a child mm -hmm. as you neared 40. Why, when you knew there was a possibility that Charles was going to be deployed? That was exactly why. And in fact, that was the deciding factor. When he told me that he got orders from Iraq, that changed everything in my life because I just was used to him always being there like a warm blanket. He was my best friend and he was just always there. I could be off reporting a story in the Dominican Republic. He might be in the desert in California training his soldiers, but I knew he was coming back. And I knew I'd be able to talk to him and see him and laugh with him. This was the first time in our relationship that I thought, oh my gosh, he's not going to be here. And it put everything in perspective. We had put off, mostly me, the decision to get married for years. I just wasn't ready to settle and, down. And, and why, I mean, even when he was going, why did you not decide to marry him before he mm -hmm. went off to Iraq? Well, we actually were planning to. And his training was becoming all-consuming. I got pregnant right away and was, you know, having morning sickness and all those things, trying to work. And I finally said to him, I said, Charles, I feel like we're trying to cram a lifetime of living into a few months. Why don't we wait and just, you know, look forward to having our baby, get you through this year, and then we'll, we'll plan a wedding. And I also thought that that would be a way for him to, to motivate, uh, keep him motivated. I was looking for opportunities to keep his morale up. So my plan was to plan the wedding while he was gone and send him updates in Iraq. I actually planned to send cake samples in the mail wow. to Iraq to him. I couldn't do it. When he left, I thought, I can't buy a wedding dress and have it hanging in the closet and this man is away in Iraq and I just couldn't bring myself to order invitations and put the date down there knowing there was a chance that he might not come back so I just sort of froze and waited um, but the earlier decision not to get married really was just that I had to grow into this relationship it took me a while to realize this man was as good as I thought he was yes he was gonna stay I didn't have to be perfect I didn't have to be Halle Berry and he'd love me anyway and that took some time and I think it does take a a, a while to to know people it's usually not a problem but we ran out of time yeah we're gonna take a short break we'll be back after the following messages <laughs> Welcome back to One to One. I'm Cheryl McCarthy of the City University, and I'm talking with New York Times senior editor Dana Kennedy about her book, A Journal for Jordan, A Story of Love and Honor. It's just been published by Crown. What were the reactions of your family, your friends, and your colleagues to your pregnancy? Mm -hmm. 
oh my goodness, everybody was so excited. And Jordan, he's become the newsroom mascot. I'm telling oh, you. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh, they just love him at, at the times. My colleagues were amazing. And, you know, partly because, well, they're just fabulous people and I love them, but they knew that I was alone, that Charles was in Iraq. My family could not have been happier. They were all waiting for Charles and I to get married and start a family. And we did it in the reverse order because I was turning 40 and he was leaving for the war. But everybody was just thrilled. You seem and they to have still had are. a great support system. Mm -hmm. for your pregnancy and childbirth. Yes, I did. Well, the interesting thing is that, and I write about this in the book, Charles had promised me he was going to come home for Jordan's birth, but he'd only been away at the war for three months, and he was in charge of over 100 very young men. And he called me a few weeks before Jordan was due to be born and said, I can't come. I cannot leave these young men. They're scared. They're just getting acclimated to being in Iraq. And I was furious, and I was scared. Uh, eventually, we worked through that, and I understood the, the tremendous sacrifice he made. It was his personal sacrifice not to be there, but it, it did cause a lot of anxiety for me. I'm, here I'm about to have this baby, and I didn't have a plan B, but I ended up surrounded by these amazing women. My mom, my two best friends were there, and uh, we welcomed Jordan into the world, and Charles actually wrote an entry in the journal about the fact that he was surrounded by strong women when he was brought into the world, and that that's an example of why you should always respect women, and those are the kinds of things that Charles wrote in this journal. After his death, after Charles's death, you were determined to retrace his last moments. Describe what that process was like. Awful. Um, uh, uh, it was terrible. I had to interview the soldiers who were at the scene when he died in the con, con uh, boy. He was, he was blown up in a Humvee. I had to do it. I needed to know what happened to him so that I could put it in context in my head and be able to live with it. And I also thought one day I'd have to explain this to my son. But that reporting was awful. I had to interview the medic <coughs> at the scene, the doctor who was at the hospital when they brought him in in Baghdad, and many of his soldiers who were in the convoy. And it was, it was very difficult. I actually had to walk away from the book for a few weeks. Uh, Did you take time off from your job just to do that? I took a year off for the book. Did you really? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This this was something I just had to dedicate myself to full time. I had to do this. I needed to do something with my grief, as hard as it was. You learned that the circumstances of soldiers' deaths in Iraq are often sanitized mm -hmm. by the military. Tell mm -hmm. me about that. Well, I think the main reason for that, there, there are a couple of reasons. One is that when a soldier dies, they want to get an officer to your house as fast as possible so that the information doesn't leak out and you hear about it unofficially. That would be the worst thing. Uh, one, the information could be wrong, and you could be told that somebody died and they didn't. Um, so they often send somebody, I think, without a lot of information. They just send them quickly to, to let you know officially that you've, you've lost your loved one. The other thing is that many of the counts, accounts of what happened differ, but they're not it's not as simple as lying. Uh, in many cases, the, it's, it's the soldiers at the scene see and hear different things because they arrive at different points. You can imagine how chaotic it would be a setting like that, a, a bomb explosion in the middle of a in the middle of the desert. And and the other thing is that many of the soldiers want to try to protect you from from the grief, and that was a big part of it as well. And so all those things collectively mean that there are conflicting stories about what happened. But as a reporter. Uh, I, I had to know, and I was a reporter at that point, because I, I used those skills to find the information that I needed. I needed it personally, foremost. I needed it for my son, and I needed it for my book, in so that you, order. So you didn't find that the military was trying to put a spin on these deaths for public relations purposes? Did you, know, you find I, any I, of that? I don't know about that. I think that there, there may be some of that that goes on, but what I mostly found was that the soldiers at the scene had different accounts of what happened. Now, there is some sanitizing of the soldiers' belongings when, when they're brought back. They officially do that in case Cleaning there's any... Them up. Yes. In case there's any sensitive material that needs to be taken out, let's say uh, pictures of secret uh, military facilities, for example. The other reason they do that, again, is, I think, to try to minimize people's suffering. Whether that's right or wrong is not for me to say. Uh, for example, taking back in the original condition others, it might devastate them to right. see that. And so I'm, I'm not one to say whether that's right or wrong, but that does go on. What did you learn from the soldiers who worked with Charles? First of all, the heroism 
of these men is just incredible. The things they did to try to save his life put their own lives in danger. But I also came to respect even more what a leader he was. He revered these, uh, these men revered him. They, uh, he ate last, he slept last. He was completely dedicated to them. And it was, uh, it started before they got there. Many of them had just graduated from high school. Many of them didn't have fathers and he was the first father figure a lot of them had. He did things that were not in his job description. He taught them to balance their checkbooks. He taught them about birth control. I mean, he really, really, and he loved them and he wrote about that in the journal. You, you said that you wrote the book partly to put a face and name to at least one American soldier, to shed light on what so many American families are experiencing. Um, I, I mean, what, did you learn something in a larger sense about that issue from writing the book? About the military? Mm -hmm. uh, well, wh what I've learned actually has been through the book tour, which is that a lot of people don't know soldiers, you know, or, or anybody who's lost a, a soldier fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I never wanted to write this book. I wish it didn't exist, because if it didn't exist, that means Charles would be here and there'd be no story. But I felt like if I had to publicly put myself out there, um, to write an account that was thorough and accurate and honest and that would help sensitize people to the war and realize that soldiers like Charles have names and families and children's and dreams and futures, then I was willing to do that. I understand a movie's being planned starring yes. Denzel Washington. Yes. <laughs> Is he going to play Charles? That's still to be decided, but I, I think so as of now. But he has purchased the movie rights along with Columbia Pictures, and, and Jordan and I have gotten to know him quite well. He's a wonderful man, very uh -huh. spiritual family man, and uh, he's he's very, very deeply involved with the story and, and moved by it. Are you excited about that? And I am. It's it's you know it's it's interesting. It's hard to be excited about these things because Charles isn't here. Right. Um, right. I'm proud, and I'm proud of, of what this means for, for people knowing about his legacy and for what, uh, Char or what Jordan will know about his dad. So I am, I'm, I'm proud. Are you going to have any involvement in the movie? I'm a consultant on the film, Are yes. you? Mm -hmm. Are you? Mm -hmm. Do you have any um, recordings of, of, of Charles for you and Jordan to share? Is that... I have one, mm -hmm. and I treasure that because he will be able to see his father's movements and hear his voice and see his mannerisms. It's interesting, though. That that will be good for Jordan. I don't have to see it because I tell you, his son is a clone of him. He walks like him. He talks like him. He looks like him. It's really a blessing. Mm -hmm. And Jordan has an older sister. Yes, he does. From Christina. Charles's early mm -hmm. marriage. marriage. Mm -hmm. Where is she? And she's in Texas. How's she doing? She's doing good. I just talked to her last night. In fact, she called to speak to her brother, and he was counting to ten in Spanish for her. So she was just tickled. Oh, really? She's a beautiful, wonderful girl, and um, we love her very much, and have actually gotten a lot closer to her since her dad passed. And she's very protective of Jordan. Completely adores him, and uh, I think she's going to come for spring break. She's in college now to to visit with us. Mm -hmm. What kinds of reactions do you get from, you know, the people who've read the book or from, you know, what you have to share with them? It's been unbelievable. Truly, truly a gift. I didn't expect this. People praying for us all over the country. People coming and giving me hugs. I've heard from military families. Uh, one lady came uh, to one of my book readings and she handed me a photo of this man and an adorable baby and it was her husband and he had died in Iraq. Another family showed up last week, three daughters and a mother and the husband was on his fourth tour in Iraq. Even then he had just left. Uh, lots of military families I've heard from. Soldiers have emailed me saying they're going back to Iraq and they're taking journals with them now uh, after having read this. Wow. And, and I had a lady and her husband attend one and say to me, we didn't know any soldiers, and thank you, we now feel like we know a soldier, and that makes the war personal. Mm -hmm. And so I've been truly blessed by the response and the people I've met. How do you keep, I mean, you have certainly kept um, Charles real, I think, for, made him real for a lot of us. How do you keep him real for Jordan? Well, hmm, it's interesting that you ask that because this morning, Jordan was literally walking around his bedroom wearing a pair of his dad's shoes, clomping around. He's only two. Mm -hmm. And his babysitter came in and he said, look, look, they're daddy's shoes. And he's trying to learn to tie his shoes. And so, you know, he's going to learn to tie shoes on his father's shoes. And uh, 
his dad's flag that was on his coffin is uh, his mother Charles's mother gave it to us and it's in Jordan's room. Mm -hmm. There's a a, an a a print of an angel that Charles drew that hangs over Jordan's bed. I don't want to make Jordan's room, you know, a mausoleum, but there are reminders of his father and we talk about him all the time. The the thing is too that Jordan's been asking about his dad a lot lately and that's painful for me. Uh -huh. Really painful. Uh -huh. He uh, he knows that daddy lives with God, but he 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 keeps asking why why isn't he coming back? Right. And and so I tried to tell him the other day that daddy's body got really, really hurt and the doctors tried to fix him, but they couldn't. And he said, but mommy, I can help. I can give God some Band-Aids. And I just don't know what to say yeah. when he says those things. What did you learn from your relationship with Charles? Hmm. I'd be here for the next five hours trying to answer that question. But the short answer is that love in its purest sense without ego and without pretense and all that is a beautiful gift. And that when you're looking for that person, the most important qualities are not the superficial, it's not what they wear and how they look and all of that, it's the heart. And this man had that. He wasn't perfect and I say that in the book and our relationship was not perfect, but it was as good as I've ever seen and I'm blessed to have had him for the time I did. Well, thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you. We're out of time. I want to thank Dana Kennedy for joining me. A Journal for Jordan, A Story of Love and Honor has just been published by Crown. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.